<coughs> Good evening. Does that work? Good evening. Welcome to this evening's Dean's Distinguished Lecture. I'm Eileen Kleinsorge, College of Business Dean and holder of the Sarah Hart Kimball Chair. The topic of this evening's presentation and discussion is important, I believe, to everyone in the room. In January, the College of Business adopted a code of honor after much discussion among faculty and students about compromised ethics and behavior. This decision and defining the code did not happen quickly. It was a thoughtful process about defining what business ethics means to the College of Business and what, if anything, needed to be done to ensure that we are graduating profession-ready students who will act with the integrity that will make us proud. As a result of this reflection, we defined business ethics as a key initiative for the college and have shared this renewed focus with several alumni and business partners. All of them are very excited and assure me that we have made the right choice in this investment. Our alumni and business partners are embracing this initiative and are showing their support. Just yesterday, I was meeting with my Dean's Circle of Excellence, which is a group of alumni and executives that serve as an advisory board to our college. When I discuss today's events and our code of honor, the interest and feedback again assured me that the discussion and the focus we are putting on business ethics is important. This group of high level executives reiterated the value of educating our students with an understanding of what ethical behavior is in the workplace. Students, these are the people that are going to be ready to hire Oregon State graduates, the people that could hire you. This initiative was developed by your peers. With input from College of Business faculty, a student task force drafted the Code of Honor, which then was presented to the faculty by those students and ultimately approved. With the cornerstones of integrity, respect, and responsibility, we expect the Code of Honor will build character and provide an expectation of the values of a College of Business student and ultimately graduate. What does this have to do with this evening? When I was doing my research and considering speakers for this year, I knew that this topic was important for everyone here this evening. For students, for business leaders, for the university community, and the business community. In January, Dr. Francesca Gino was here to discuss how to think and, be and behave with integrity in the business environment. A psychologist and Harvard Business School professor, she has studied the forces at play when our choices end up colliding with our goals. Dr. Gino discussed research on judgment and decision making, negotiation, ethics, motivation, productivity, and creativity. This evening, we welcome John Hall to discuss the applications of research and how ethics is essential in the workplace. John has a passion for advising and building businesses that execute the values that it takes to be successful in competitive global environments where ethics and integrity can get lost. He has more than 25 years of experience developing a wide range of companies and growing them into market leaders. He has leveraged his specific expertise in sales, marketing, business development, and operations to transform companies, resulting in each firm being acquired by global enterprises. 
With experience as a senior executive at Unicrew, BLT Technologies, and as the executive vice president and ethics officer for Ethics Points Incorporated, John began his own consultancy firm, 16 Degree Ad Ad Advisory, a cutting edge business that forward thinking executives rely on for innovative business building solutions. Students, faculty, and the Oregon State and Corvallis communities, I give you John Hall. Thank you very much. Well, thank you all this evening. Can you hear me fine? So again, uh, today we're going to, uh, this evening we're going to talk a little bit about how do you apply a code of honor, which you all have here, and what that does out in the real world. Um, but ultimately, we have issues of where profit comes into it and makes it a little bit uh, unclear. But the first thing I'd like to just start off with is to just ask the question, you know, why listen to me? Um, I, uh, for the past, uh, we, you know, 25 years I've been building businesses, but for the past 12 years I have actually really dedicated my life in the ethics and compliance space. Uh, my company that I helped co-found in uh, 2002, Ethics Point, um, we provided compliance software tools to uh, ultimately 2,400 global customers around the, uh, around the world, and we also had, uh, you know, did about $25 million in revenue. But probably more importantly, ultimately, we uh, got acquired by a private equity firm. We wrapped that, a number of different ethics businesses together uh, into a, a firm now called Navix Global that had the uh, ethics software tools, it had online ethics training and policy management. And that today is a well over $100 million business, 550 employees. and. And up until a year ago, served as the chief ethics and compliance officer of that organization. And so the other part of it is for the last 10 years, I have spent you know, my life creating products, but also working with the ethics officers uh, throughout um, the United States and internationally on really what were their issues and how they were trying to manage things uh, in a global enterprise. So we were all part of the Ethics Officers Association, Society of uh, Corporate Compliance, um, and then also Privacy. And then in 2009, I actually personally went and got my uh, certification to be an Ethics and Compliance Officer. So uh, for the last 12 years, I've been in this space um, and really where kind of the rubber meets the road. And one thing that people have always asked is, you know, what, why did you want to go into the ethics and compliance. And uh, one of my colleagues here, uh, the ethics officer from PepsiCo, I think really has a great perspective of uh, um, the compliance world. So he basically, uh, what he says, you know, I like, I, like, I sleep like a baby, meaning I wake up every night screaming and crying. And that's really, I think, when you have 250,000 employees that you're trying to manage, I would imagine that that is something that uh, you might have to deal with. Uh, but personally, you know, I, in a lot of ways, got kind of tired of the, um, the stuff that went on in, in business and really wanted to kind of uh, be able to promote um, a higher level of values uh, and, and really being some, part of something that was much larger than myself. So we're going to start off by talking a little bit about um, you know, is there a problem out here? So here's, here's a, the reality check of it. And uh, there are a number of organizations in the compliance world that um, do research studies, and every, typically every two years. And this is one which is uh, the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners. And they do a global uh, uh, report to the nation. And so I'm gonna go through these slides rather quickly because there's a lot of information here, but it really just kind of set the context of kind of this is the reality of what is happening with occupational fraud out in the marketplace. 
So the first thing here is around corporate fraud. The, uh, the initial detection of corporate fraud is uh, tips. So tips that come in, followed by management re reviews, uh, and then you can see that 7% of the uh, things are identified by accident. So that is how the, uh, the incidents are occurred. Now the sources uh, of those tips, you know, predominantly are employees. Employees coming forward saying, I've seen uh, this kind of activity going on, but you also have customers. And then you have the anonymous, which is actually one of the services that we provide is the, the anonymous whistleblowing uh, services. But also you can see at the very bottom that 1.5% their competitors are, are helping them identify problems too. The type of organizations, typically you have the private companies have the largest frequency of, but again, there are many more of them, uh, publicly traded companies, and then our faithful government is around 17% of the incidents, and then also nonprofits. And then you look at industries with the highest uh, fraud. Um, obviously, the banking and financial services, if you know after uh, 2008, uh, they created the downturn. Um, this is clearly where a huge amount of uh, uh, fraud has, has occurred. But you look at number two is, is your government and public administration that just overtook uh, manufacturing over the last two years. Healthcare is very predominant in fourth place. And then in fifth place is the education market, which is kind of interesting. The, uh, now what we're going to do is we're going to transfer our uh, view of kind of the corporate fraud to literally kind of who are the perpetrators? Who are the people inside these organizations uh, that are doing it? And uh, so as you can see by here, you know, predominantly the number of incidents are being occurred by employees, non-managerial employees, um, you know, 37% with uh, managers, and then owners and executives are around 17%. So, so look at this proportionally between these positions of employee, manager, and executive, and now look at what that same is it, chart is on the median loss, so the amount of the fraud that occurs by those same positions. So you typically have the owners and executives at an average of $373,000, uh, and then your employees at $50,000. So obviously the higher up you are in the organization, uh, you can, uh, you have more of a propensity to uh, uh, make the larger uh, deals. The, uh, now another area here is on the research is that predominantly uh, it's one perpetrator involved. Uh, when you have two or more, uh, it is typically a, um, a worse situation. The, the, the risk is much higher and the financial risk is much higher. And the, uh, so then by gender, uh, males 65% overall, 35% uh, for female. Now, this is a global study, and I think it's kind of interesting. The next slide is actually just gender by region. I just thought it was an interesting thing that showed how predominantly, you know, males are the perpetrators, but particularly in cultures where females aren't maybe in positions to be able to do that. Uh, so you can see pretty much in, in the Asia, Africa, South, I mean, I know that for a fact that that's why they are, uh, it's less there, but then you have the United States, and then at the bottom you actually have Canada who crossed the chasm, and actually 51% are, are female there, so. Then by age, you know, you have about 55% of them that are between 35 and 45 years of age, um, and uh, within the tenure of the organization, you know, pe people that have been there between one and five years, but also you can see in the six to 10 and even more than that, that you know, they're still at around 25%. And then I thought, this, you know, you're all about ready to be college graduates. Uh, so the median uh, theft from a college degree is $200,000. That's kind of interesting. It's two and a half times more than a high school graduate. Um, and then postgraduate, um, you're top of the class in, in, in both of these categories. So, uh, um, and then ultimately by department within the organizations, and these are really aligned with um, how um, the things go, accounting, 
operations, sales, and executive leadership. Is, that's typically where you see a lot of the fraud. Also down the way, about halfway down, is purchasing, another uh, strong area. Um, so, so that, I just wanted to kind of give you a framework. It's, I don't want you to think that, oh my goodness, the world's coming to an end, there's fraud everywhere, and it's that. But this is a, that was a study that was done to kind of give you a sense of uh, how it's happening, who's doing it. Um, so the next question is really, you know, does the federal government really care? And I, I would just say the answer to that question is yes, they do. Um, what they have done is there is a, uh, a committee called the Federal Sentencing Commission that a long time ago defined a, uh, um, the, the federal sentencing guidelines. And then there is chapter eight, and it's on how to have a, an effective ethics and compliance um, uh, program. And so this is the guideline that all ethics officers and companies use, universities, nonprofits, in how do they design an ethics and compliance program that they can initiate. Now, uh, I, will, uh, I will tell you that this is as much of a mitigation tool for a corporation, because if an employee um, does something wrong. You have somebody that has committed a bribery. The company is liable for that. So what the company does is all of a sudden they get busted for that, that, uh, that event that occurred, that bribery. And so then they go in front, of the, uh, a, in front of a judge, and the judges use the federal sentencing guidelines as a mitigating tool to whatever their violation, you know, whatever their penalties are going to be uh, financially uh, or even, you know, um, criminal. So what they actually, the reality is they go in and they try to, con the company tries to convince that the company has all these elements in place or certain degrees and they validate them in order to basically reduce the company's exposure. Um, and, you know, in certain instances where, where may it be deemed appropriate, is that those, those, those people that actually committed them, I mean, they're basically saying this is a rogue employee that did something that was beyond our policies, and therefore we as a company can't be held liable for it. So it's an interesting uh, uh, play out there in how this has worked, but let me just kind of go through it. The, the, there's the implementation of standards and procedures, policies and pre procedures that you define. Um, you have to assign a high level uh, personnel to oversee them. So typically, it would well, you'd have the ethics officer, but that ethics officer should report to s somebody on the board. Um, the reason all this came about was uh, through, uh, litig through a whole regulatory uh, process called Sarbanes-Oxley, which was back in 2002 is when it came into, uh, uh, into law. It was all about that um, there was no p people on the board that understood the financials. So Sarbanes-Oxley required that, that you have people on the board that really understand that. And so that's kind of along the lines here is that you have to have somebody on the board that, that takes ownership of this. Number three is you, when you're delegating it, you want to make sure that you're delegating it to people that actually have ethics or integrity. You don't put the, you know, the fox in the chicken coop uh, per se. And so, um, then it's training and educating your employees, monitoring, auditing, reporting, having reporting systems for them, and then developing appropriate responses for the offenses so that you're consistent uh, on the consequences for, for common types of incidents. And then that you're effectively uh, evaluating it um, uh, over time. And the other thing too is that the, the Justice Department is the one that actually backs up this, and uh, they, they have fined uh, thir over $13 billion in 2012 with a 91% conviction rate. So they, mean, they do mean business. They probably should be doing more, uh, but uh, um, it is really you know, an important thing. So now I want to kind of step back again and just look at, we talked about you know, this, the seven elements of an effective ethics and compliance program. Um, do they really work? And so, if you, pardon me here for a moment, 
I've got a short video that I would like to show you. Hey, Betty. You ever witness someone at work doing something that just doesn't seem right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have, but I didn't know what to do, so I didn't do anything at all. That's it? What's it, Alan? Maybe if we had some kind of guideline we could refer to when we find ourselves in a pickle. Well, then... Yes, go on. I was going to, but then you interrupted. Some kind of a handbook of rules that spells out right and wrong, black and white, sometimes even the gray. Then we know exactly what to do. Yes, that's it. It's brilliant. Does the big cheese upstairs know about this? Not yet. Come on. What's all the hubbub? Alan's got a swell idea about a list of things to help us ethically do our job. Alan figured out a way to spell out various company practices. Like a wrong and right way to do things handbook? Well, that title's a little clunky, but yeah. Mm-hmm. Sir, I've got something to say, and I think you're going to want to hear this. I've got an idea, not just any idea, but one that will make this company stronger and more cohesive. It's a document that spells out just what this company stands for. It outlines acceptable and unacceptable behavior within the parameters of our industry and allows everyone here to reference it at any time. You're talking about a code of conduct? Yes, a code of conduct. Exactly, sir. We've had one for 12 years. We, we, we do? Mm-hmm. When you were hired, you all signed a form saying that you'd read it. We, we did? Mm-hmm. Oh. Never mind. Okay. Well, let, let me just tell you that that is not uh, too far from the truth. Um, that really a lot of people, the, typically the code of conduct is one of the, the elements uh, that you use for your policies, but uh, I will tell you every job I ever had, you know, you know, I signed a form, but I never really read the information. And uh, so now uh, there's a lot more process in place to be able to do that through training. The, uh, let me point out too that the, this video clip uh, if you've, uh, you're familiar with Saturday Night Live, there's an organization called uh, Second City, uh, which is out of Chicago, and that's the feeder to Saturday Night Live. And Second City has a communications company called Second City Communications, and they uh, do little videos of ethics and compliance to help corporations kind of support. And this is just one of the clips that they do that they uh, uh, let me use, but this is again about how to reinforce and they're using their, their uh, comedians to do it. So let's just talk a little bit about what it is an ethics culture. And you know, a culture, uh, um, you know, a business, you know, culture encompasses everything uh, about an employee's duties, how they interact with their customers, uh, how they interact with their um, uh, their bosses, and the really the strength of a culture is really defined by how well an organization supports that. The, um, as you have that, you know, the, it has to be supported from the top, uh, and it also has to be supported in the middle, and it has to be supported at the lower ends of the organization with kind of a peer commitment. And now I'm gonna talk a little bit about, so back to the, you know, do these ethics and compliance programs work? Uh, the Ethics Resource Center is uh, based in Washington, D.C., and they also do research. And so here's going to be some uh, research on uh, ethics and compliance programs. So one of the things that the, you see by this, and I'll do this kind of quickly, is that uh, observed misconduct is on the decline. So that is actually a positive thing in, uh, in the ethics business. The, um, the a strong commitment to an ethics culture drives employee conduct. And when companies value ethical performance and build strong cultures, misconduct is substantially lowered. So if you look at this slide uh, in 2013, it shows that if you're on your strength of your ethics, uh, if you have a strong ethics culture, your uh, 
20% uh, of your people are observing misconduct versus a weak culture where 88% uh, are observing misconduct. Also, that about two in, out of three companies have a positive uh, ethics culture. And this is a, um, um, one that talks a little bit about how when you have a, I, I mentioned it earlier, when you have multiple people that are involved in an incident, it creates a much higher risk to the organization. And this slide over, if you look over here on the, the far side here, this is really with a strong ethics culture, the majority of the incidents are occurring from individuals. When, it's, when the blue and the orange are large, like they are on the left, that it creates you know, some very big systemic issues that, that need to be uh, dealt with, but that also supports that you know, a weak culture, you'll end, up having, you'll, you'll end up having more of that. And then in the, uh, even though that uh, the good news re that reporting continues to remain high, and this is basically saying that 63% of employees will report a wrongdoing if in fact they see it. Um, but unfortunately, also, the retaliation rates are still relatively high at around 21%. And uh, the, uh, when, you look at, when you ask the people that did not report, one third of them said the reason they didn't report was the fear of senior management um, coming down on them. Then, uh, then also you look at where, where do people internally report within an organization. Typically, people go to their supervisor first, and this is what we've always recommended. Go to your supervisor, if not their boss, then you can go to HR, uh, and then you ultimately can go to your anonymous hotline or helpline. So those are the vehicles that people use to bring those incidents forward. So, you know, really, what does this mean uh, to me? What does this mean to you? And uh, if you bear with me, I, I will give you another hopeful reason to laugh here. Stan, nice to meet you at the trade show this weekend. Please pass along this bid information to your colleagues at Power Cotec. What? Power Cotec is our competitor. Oh, this email was meant for Stan Connor. This guy must have just typed Stan and let his email autofill the rest. Ah, this is competitive information. I shouldn't be reading this. What a lucky break for you. Some competitive intelligence fell right into your lap. You'd be a fool not to read it. Stan, you're only allowed to use publicly available information obtained in an ethical manner to make your decisions. Looking at these numbers would violate company policy. That's true, but I mean, maybe it was a, a lucky accident. I mean, it's not my fault he sent it to me, right? Of course not. Right. You were meant to have it. Just take down the numbers as a reference point for what PowerCotech is doing. Stan, you have to reply to the email and let the sender know they sent it an error. Then delete it and disregard any information you might have inadvertently seen. Bah! Then inform your compliance officer of the mistake. You're no fun. You're evil. Shut up, both of you. Just shut up. Good. Feel the hatred flow through you. Now. Strike me down and your journey toward the dark side will be complete. Isn't that from Star Wars? Ah, Lucas stole that from me. Uh, what was I thinking? I know I should delete this email. This isn't my information and, and using it, I could get both me and Energy Co. In, in a lot of trouble. Well done, Stan. You what? passed the test. What? Susan Baker, Energy Co. Compliance Department. Hi. Uh, sorry, I thought that the, the... The talking puppets were real? Yeah. A surprising number of people do. Huh. I was just walking by your office, and I saw you talking to yourself, so I put on my little puppets, and I crawled up behind you. Okay, now that I say that out loud, it sounds super weird. It does. But it's not. Well, I mean, do you really think it's ethical to eavesdrop on employees when they talk to themselves? Don't listen to him. Of course, it's ethical. All right, so let's let's 
Uh, Eileen had talked about this earlier, about your, uh, your code of honor that you've developed here. And uh, you know, I think that it's really uh, important when you look at this to envision what does this mean to me here uh, as a student, but also what does this mean going forward? And so you know, obviously you kind of have the three pillars. You have integrity, um, you know, being honest and having strong moral principles. You have respect to others and fair treatment and competition with others. Responsibility, being accountable. Um, but also what you have here is this is the uh, corporate values that I had developed for my company Ethics Point. And you'll notice they look pretty similar. You see respect in there, um, accountability, which would be like responsibility and commitment. And uh, so, but there, there's a couple I just want to just make a, a, a mention of, which are, you know, we really tried to develop a servant leadership uh, uh, model of, of leadership at Ethics Point. And so when you look at uh, the top one here being authenticity, um, uh, which was really about creating trust and transparency, and then this lower one, which is humility. And that is probably something you don't usually see on a corporate value statement. Uh, but really, from a humility standpoint, um, if any of you have read uh, Good to Great, uh, the book by Jim Collins, uh, that really looks at the success of businesses and what makes great, good companies great, and there's in, in, the, in the leadership area, it's a level it's level one to level uh, five leaders. And most leaders, you know, high powered leaders are level four, but there's this uniqueness of a level five. And really the defining factor between a level four and a level five is humility. And it's not something you really find a whole lot of out there. Uh, so when you do see it, it really shines. So I just wanted, I just wanted to kind of uh, uh, point that out. Now, also, uh, back when I started in the uh, ethics world, uh, there was this company called Enron, big, huge uh, energy company, and they were touted as ha of having this, the best, strongest code of ethics out there. Um, and uh, you know, as you can see, here's their values. You see respect, you see integrity, excellence, communication. So you know, you see a lot of these uh, same words out there. And the one word that I have always struggled with is this word integrity. And, and again, I had a company that's, it, our tagline, so it was Ethics Point, and our tagline was integrity at work. So to have a company and, and struggle with that word uh, means, I think it's, it's just very, it, it's very difficult. So integrity, which is, you know, I would consider to be the pillar of your code of honor, um, is really defined by the adherence to moral and ethical principles soundness to moral character and honesty. And then uh, it also has a state of being whole and undivided. But this is the problem, is the word integrity, character, ethic, and morality are so interchangeable out there. People just use them very differently. And they, and they mean a very, diff, uh, very different uh, uh, connotation. So I'd just like to kind of step back and look at you know, what this, you know, what these words mean. So ethic refers to the defined standard of right and wrong, okay? You could also say this is values, but ethic is your defined standard, whereas morality is your lived standard of right and wrong, okay? So you got your defined standard and your lived standard. And then integrity means sound, complete, and integrated. So you know, it, integrity, inter, in, integrated is really kind of the essence of integrity. And so when you have defined standards plus lived standards, you should have integrity. And this is, let me even make it simpler. If you have a ethic, this is your defined standard of what is right and wrong. If you have a ethics or values, that is aligned with your morality, so it's aligned with your lived out standard, you have integrity, okay? But if you have an ethic and a value, values that are not aligned with how you live out your life, you have lack of integrity or hypocrisy. You're a hypocrite. 
So I think it's really important. It's probably one of the best, the, the thing that I want you to come away most of all is this, is just about what are my values, what is my ethic, and how am I living it out? So let's go back to Enron. You know, Ken Lay, 2000, he was, had the most pristine, you know, defined code of ethic. 2003, didn't really live it out very well. So again, back to that equation, this would be ethics and values. Really strong, it was written down, it was great. They certainly didn't apply it, um, and therefore it was complete hypocrisy. So if I were just to ask, you know, what are the two questions I really would like you to ask yourselves you know, tonight is, you know, what do I want in a leader? And also, what type of leader do I want to be? Now, the reason um, these questions are so important is you have to understand you are future leaders, okay? You can change things. What you saw up there earlier, you can, you know, I think we're, we're changing and we're, we're getting better, uh, but uh, um, you have this great opportunity and you can take hold of it. You can have an impact and I cannot tell you that enough. Um, you know, really the question is what will be your ethic? Now, I believe that most of you have an ethic or values that are, are, are already, you know, embedded in you. Uh, whether that is through your, uh, your parents, um, whether it's through your grandparents, maybe a spiritual advisor or something like that, but you have a certain set of guidelines of right and wrong already ingrained and wired into you, and that's that little voice that comes out occasionally. So do listen to it. But the biggest question is, you know, what will be your morality? You know, how are you going to live out those standards of right and wrong? And when you live in a world, and believe me, the business world, and I, I mean, you probably had this at the last speaker, it, the business world is full of gray. Um, so you need to have something to anchor in on uh, in order to help you make you know, decisions. So uh, there's a, you know, as, as fellow leaders, uh, of, our, of our future, I would just give you a, a little bit of advice of some guidelines around leadership. Um, you know, first of all, uh, there's a saying, you know, what is good for the goose is good for the gander. I mean, in essence, really what it's saying is that as a leader, you are not above the people beneath you. Um, I have been in numerous situations where we were growing a business and we had to cut back and we first had the leadership have the salary cutbacks before we ever had anybody else do it. And that is, you know, that is something that you just, you cannot hold yourself above your, peop your people. The next thing is practice what you preach. And if, you know, in mentoring, you know, it's not what you say, it's what you do. And that builds trust. Then don't make any promises you can't keep. Um, you know, that's really treat, you know, treat other people the way you would want to be treated. Take responsibility f for your mistakes. You know, own up to it with humility. Um, you will, you'll be surprised how great of an impact that is. Because keep in mind, they already know, you know, so you're, you're not pulling the wool over their eyes. Statement of kind of winning, you know, at all costs is for losers. If you want to have longevity um, uh, in relationships, in a business, or anything like that, it really requires pursuing a win-win relationship. Uh, speak the truth. Um, this is something, personally, I will say I have had uh, trouble with from the perspective that I value relationships so much. They are so important to me. And when I would have people that work for me, I you know, loved them, I just, I felt so much about it, but I, I, so I really didn't want to hurt that relationship and so I didn't necessarily speak the truth maybe on their performance. And you know what, I, and now I realize I hurt them by doing that. So I just really, you know, speak the truth. Another saying is speak the truth and you'll never have to remember anything. Um, that will help you out. 
Um, do no harm. You know, remember, you know, the world needs more compassionate people. And then really make things better. Um, leave things better than what you were given. So as I get ready to conclude here, there is, a, in, my, in, in the old days, um, there was a saying that really resonated with me was, you know, don't do anything today that you wouldn't want your grandmother to see in the newspaper tomorrow. Well, there aren't newspapers around hardly anymore, so it comes down to YouTube. So, you know, if you did what you were thinking of doing, how would you react if a video of it were to be posted on the internet for all to see? And use that as a way of, uh, you know, kind of uh, monitoring, uh, you know, where you're going with making decisions. The other thing too is, I will just say this, in the business world, and you're all looking for jobs, if you're posting stuff on the internet, if you do not think that the companies have access to that and review that sort of stuff, you're kidding yourself. So be mindful of that type of stuff. So I've, I've got a, a concluding video, because I love these things. And uh, before we go into it, still have a gig selling lots of ivy stuff but i took a doctor golf and paid for it all by myself i thought the rules were there for somebody else but not for me now i'm doing three to five in a penitentiary should have listened to compliance but now it's way too late i could have seen this coming at me but now i've sealed my fate they put me in a courtroom they threw the book at me Same mistake, my friends, listen up attentively. We're telling you compliance. Don't sit there like a blob. The rules must be obeyed or it could cost us all our jobs. Compliance, put down that blackberry. Woo! Wish I had a listen and be compliantly. Well, John, you've given us a lot to consider and to evaluate. Honor, integrity, values, morality, respect, and responsibility. These are words that must be acted out and held at a level of responsibility. At this time, I'd like to introduce Anara Scott, an assistant professor in the College of Business. Professor Scott practiced law for more than a decade before joining the faculty at Oregon State. In private practice, she represented clients on matters including general corporate and business law, employment, construction, and product liability. She went on to specialize in energy and regulatory law, representing a variety of utility clients across the Northwest. Her research is centered around the transformation of the utility system, clean energy, energy efficiency, and utility regulation. This evening, Professor Scott will be hosting the moderated session of the program, and then we will open the conversations to questions from you. Anara and John, please have a seat. All righty. Well, thank you for a fantastic presentation and a lot of great data mixed in there with some really good lessons about how to proceed. Um, but I just wanted to start actually with giving you a chance to give us a little of your personal story, maybe talk a little bit about you were a very successful entrepreneur. Um, what led you to pursue ethics both in your professional 
um, work and also in your personal life? Uh, yeah, it's, um, so I kind of grew up, I, my father was an entrepreneur. Um, I grew up with that, um, that ilk to go out and, you know, for the, uh, for the first part of my life, I was basically interested in three things. I wanted to be my own boss, I wanted to be an entrepreneur, and I wanted to make millions. Not a, you know, not a bad thing. Uh, well, at age 35, it happened to me. Um, and to tell you the truth, I don't think you always dream of it, but you never know what that, you know, if that ever happened, what would, what would you do? And so I didn't know what to do. So I went out, frankly, and, went and bought a bunch of stuff. And what I found was there was absolutely no value in that. So I really, you know, everything that I had been chasing uh, was empty. Um, so I was really looking for kind of this change of, in my life from success to significance and looking for significance in my life. And through that is what kind of took me along a process to uh, uh, want to, you know, do good. Um, and uh, I loved the business world. And, and when we started Ethics Point, it was really about saying, hey, I want to stand for values and morals, but it'd be in the kind of the dynamic business world. And so that got me there. And then eventually, these friends of mine that were ethics officers, when I looked at what the struggles they were going through, I really felt called to not only help eventually boards of directors understand what's important in ethics and values uh, within their organizations, but also, frankly, it's why I'm here. Um, I want you know these students to understand that uh, um, uh, there is more to life than what I thought there was, and um, it is a uh, um, it's a whole lot more fun, and you don't have to look behind your back or anything like that if you just kind of kind of applied, you know, I had to learn the hard way to get to those, those guidelines that I kind of gave you earlier, so. Well, at least you figured it out before you ended up on yeah, the, yeah, the my seeing jumpsuit. tanking. <laughs> so, um, so I was really struck by the chart that you showed that had the, you know, the, the weak to strong ethical culture and the way that that changed the nature of misconduct within a company. Um, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how do you take a company that has a weak ethical culture and how do you bring it and, and, and really build the ethical culture? Is it possible to change a culture? Yeah, oh yeah, it's, it's very possible. Um, it isn't a quick fix. Um, I would say that, well, I, I'll just give an example. So my business ethics point, I would say for the, you know, it was kind of a 10 year period of time. And I would say the first five years were really strong. Um, and then we kind of entered into a period where we had some pretty um, uh, strong personalities in the business that changed the culture of the business. And I actually wasn't particularly happy with it at the time, but I kind of found more significance outside doing other things, you know, but still playing a role in the business. Well, at some point, uh, there was a time where um, we needed to have a change from the people. So if, in fact, you know, it really comes, this, you know, the tone at the top, it is so important. You cannot, if you do not have it from the top, it will not happen. I, you know, you can beat your head against the wall as much as you want, but it won't. So in the end, you had to make, you had to make the changes uh, to have the tone at the top. And so we actually went through that process. And then the, the values that we put up there, now you understand why we had humility and authenticity and accountability. Um, we had, I stood up in front of our 175 employees at, um, and basically said to them, you know, with, you know, I guess, authenticity and humility that, you know, I may be the co-founder of the business and the second largest shareholder, but for the past three years, I would never have had a friend or an acquaintance come to work for the company because it wasn't what it used to be. And, and, you know, and it had ethics in its name, you know? And so, so we said we were going to change that. And, and so the leadership, we decided that we were going to lock arms on those five corporate values. And you know, and we um, made that commitment. And what we said to our employees, or what I said to the employees was, we want you, we are going to live into these. And if we don't live into them, you don't have to. 
But if we do, we ask you to join us and come along with us. And we, uh, and by the way, we had eight executives. Uh, two of them couldn't live into that over the next three months and were asked to leave. Um, and then, frankly, what we also did was we tied uh, variable compensation to our executives that said, um, a anonymous 360 review by your peers and subordinates on whether you're living into those or not is whether you're going to get some compensation or not. So there was also some uh, compensation. And we, we did change it. And the, and, but it is a, um, you got to earn the trust and the respect. And I think that's why a lot of private companies have it, because they're family oriented. They, you know, they're family businesses and they have those values instilled in those organizations and that's a, it's, you know, it's, it's a lot easier there. Okay. Um, so you are obviously coming in uh, from the outside, and, and, um, and when, when you're head, head of the company, there's a lot of steps that you can take, including compensation. And, um, but are there things that we can do as individuals, so considering the students out there, as if they encounter, you know, situations maybe even here at Oregon State where they feel like the culture is not ethical, are there things that we can do as individuals to change a culture? Uh, yes, um, but I would go back to, well, I'll just you know, look at your code of honor. Um, if, you, if you do not have your leadership in support of your code of honor, just like in a, in a company, it will, it will not happen. I mean, it will, you know, you'll do something and then they won't really back you up on it. So you have to have leadership and, and you do have the, the backing. So that is the, probably the most critical thing. The second one is you have to own up to your own personal uh, ethic and morality. Uh, because if you, you can't sit there and judge somebody if you uh, are doing the same thing. So I would just say, you know, if, if leadership is there, and if you have your own personal ethic and morality, uh, you know, kind of your integrity around that, then you, I would just say, you, you, you start working with other people to bring it up within the organization and hold people accountable to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you have any, um, and we do have um, some great leadership here, but do you have any suggestions for the college as we embark on establishing this new um, code of honor into how we can bring that into the life of the college? Do you have any, maybe from the training that you've done, or you know, how do you feel like that is the best way to, to create that ethical culture? Uh, yeah, I think that a ethical culture is, you know, one of the things is that you need to know what the standards are. Um, you know, what is, and so you, you have a, a very good start on those standards. I would say that if you, promoting what integrity is, uh, it's just not a word, um, you know, integrity is a result that comes from, uh, you know, values. And so um, it's really about training people and creating awareness um, that are supported by the organization so that when something happens, there is a consequence to it. And most, and what's quite effective in training um, within the corporate world is they actually uh, will make those, um, uh, those they'll take the names out of them, they'll anonymize it, and they will say, this is what happened. A person did this, and this, is, and this was the repercussions of it. Um, because that personalizes it to a, a person. So, uh, um, and then do lots of funny little skits like those videos and stuff like that. So that it actually videos. absorbs in. <laughs> Excellent. Um, well, I think, uh, I think I'll ask maybe one more question and then we'll, uh, while we're asking our final question here, you can think of uh, you guys out there in the audience have some questions to ask. Um, so one question for potential job seekers out there. Um, obviously, it's a lot easier to come into a positive culture than to have to try to change it on the back end. So if I was going out and applying for a job today, um, which thank goodness I'm not, um, but if I was, what would you advise me as a job seeker? How, how are these students um, going to be able to tell if they are looking at an ethical company and whether it's a company that has the kind of culture that they want to work for? Yeah. Well, I would... First of all, I'm, I'm happy to see 
that we have a generation um, here that is really um, interested in, you know, more than the bottom line, more than, I mean, it's about social impact. And that is very, I mean, it's very refreshing. Um, but what I would say, so just some basic, um, a basic strategy is when you're out interviewing, go to the company's corporate website and search for, and you, you should be able to find it, but you should be able to find what their corporate values are. And so if you looked at Ethics Point and you saw those, what I would do is I would pick two of those that mean something to you. And when you are in the interview process, now again, you're interviewing for a job, they're interviewing you, but you're also interviewing them. And don't forget that because, you know, you may think times are desperate, but boy, man, doing the wrong company is, a, is far worse than uh, anything you could think of. So what I would do is I would frame a question. If you're in with either the, the leadership or the person is, and say it's the you know, integrity, I would just say, could you give me an example of when senior leadership modeled integrity in the workplace? Not, not, not what an action they did. So I think that's a great way. And, and if you get the old deer in the headlights stare, they haven't, well, they probably have never been asked that before, but you know, they're, they are not, um, it's basically saying, I don't know any examples. So there's a good indication. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also another um, a website called uh, glassdoor.com. And uh, now, it's a website that uh, can be kind of a uh, complaint, you know, where everybody's mad or, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll kind of post on there. But it's amazing what you'll find. Now, it's typically larger companies, um, but you will, you will get a sense for a company uh, by looking at that. Um, and then private companies, again, look for the family heritage if you're in, in a private company. And if it's a second generation, I mean, you know, doesn't mean they're carrying on the, the ethics and values, I'll tell you that. It's okay. That's great advice. Um, well, I think we can uh, open up the floor for questions. So I think we have a mic set up here and one on the other side. If you have questions to ask John, um, come on up and we'll just take them as they come. And tell us your name as well, please introduce yourself. Hi, John. My name is Hallie Exall, and I'm a senior here in marketing and management. Um, I have two questions for you. And the first one, I was wondering what your ideas were concerning about um, how to reward students for acting ethically and, say, like turning in other students without focusing on extrinsic rewards. First of all, you get extra credit for coming up to the mic. <laughs> extra, extra, extra credit. Extra, extra, extra credit. <laughs> um, you know, uh, incenting people for uh, bringing uh, uh, incidents forward. Uh, you know, personally, I'm not. I'm not a big fan of that. So, the, in the in the world, there's the uh, whistleblowing laws that protect retaliation against a whistleblower, mm -hmm. and the government now has these certain laws that allow the whistleblower to participate in it and are making a lot of money doing that. Um, again, I don't think there's anything wrong with bringing it forward. The motive of how you do it and how you assess it to bring it forward. Um, because a lot of the times, you know, we're in the business, we would take, you know, you know, close to, you know, 500,000 violations a year in these reports. And uh, a lot of times, you know, they were determined to be frivolous because of you know a, a particular situation, so. Okay. All right. Um, my second question is: How do you suggest um, you inform students of the new honors code system without having them just tune it out? Um, that is a very good question. Uh, I, you know, again, I think it's an ongoing process, and I think it should be uh, embedded in in kind of all the communications. Uh, that is continually being reinforced, um, uh, but I, you know, again, it's it's it does take a while, and and uh, you know, training is a good thing, but you know, you're getting a lot of training here already. Um, 
So I, I, it's about all I have for you. <laughs> all right, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Hi there, my name's Andrew Eddy. I'm a junior here studying accounting. Uh, you mentioned earlier that one third of people don't report misconduct because of fear of management coming down on them. So what advice would you have for somebody involved in that situation, hoping to report the misconduct and considering um, the potential to lose their job or become in a uh, awkward position? That's a great question. I mean, that is probably the biggest fear that anybody has um, is really coming forward with, you know, a situation. So what we uh, typically, if you, if you look at kind of the best practices and it kind of indicated on one of the slides are what are the best ways for a company to communicate on how to bring something forward because of that. You know, first is typically go to your supervisor. If you're not comfortable there, you go to their boss. If you're not comfortable, go to HR or legal. Ultimately, what they do is they offer an anonymous hotline service, which is what our company did. And we kept them anonymous. And when they would be taking a report, you know, our, our contact center people would help them make sure that they weren't putting something in the report that said, well, since I share a desk next to somebody, that type of thing, which, you know. Uh, but it is, it is one of the clearest fears that anybody has, and the retaliation does, you know, unfortunately does occur. Now, if retaliation does occur, the whistleblowing laws are very clear, um, uh, but, you know, you know, you got, you know, you, 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 you became a narc, you know, and then all of a sudden you're assigned to different positions, and then you're like, this is, I mean, it's a really, it could be a really bad thing, but that's why the anonymous reporting is a really great last resort. Thank you very so, much. So, you bet. Hi, John, thanks for coming. Vinay Ramakrishnan, Senior in Accounting. Uh, kind of a two-part question. First of all, has unethical behavior in the business world increased since the new millennium, and if so, and, and, if, and also, has success been defined more by profit since the turn of the new millennium? I'm talking about the year 2000. And, and if so, why? Um, well, you know, it's interesting. You would think that uh, in, uh, you know, typically when, it, when the uh, economy turns down, fraud typically goes up. Um, and that, that is the case. So you could say since 2008, there probably has been an increase, you know, an uptick in fraud. Um, the, uh, um, so what, I mean, your second question was? Has, has business success been defined more by profit since the new, since 2000, since the new millennium? Well, I think that the, there is always, you know, I've, I used to talk to radio stations early on, you know, after the whole Enron scandal and all that sort of stuff. And I've always believed that, you know, companies like First Call that, that go out and say, they're the ones that are, that are claiming that this company is going to have this, this earnings per share number this next quarter. And, you know, and, and, and I personally believe they are the worst thing that could have ever happened to it because then that has made people, particularly in accounting, start cooking the books, making a small little adjustment here and there. And, and really what happened with, uh, I think there are people that are, you know, bad at the top but at the, uh, in the middle area, they make a little adjustment and then they make a little one and then all of a sudden they're in the middle of this, this bad thing and they don't even know how they got there. You know, they just went through this gray area. So um, the, um, uh, but the, uh, I would say that the values of, uh, the enterprise value of businesses, there are, there are ethics quotients out there that organizations are monitoring uh, different, uh, businesses on how they are with corporate social responsibility, their codes of conduct, or there's certain things posted. And um, so I, I would say that we're, we're going in a, there's much more awareness and, and they're all. Oh, well, I mean, in the, in the 90s it was, and into the early 2000s it was a free for all. I mean, it was up until the dot, the dot com bubble. Um, uh, no, it was a free-for-all. But, you know, you've had free-for-alls in the financial market, too, you know, with your, you know, the mortgage lending and all sorts of stuff. So there's always things kind of going on, but it's, you know, kind of knocking them inside the, back inside the guardrails. We're on, we have gone down a little bit in the new 
landing, but we're coming back up. Well, I, I, I am hopeful that we're coming back up. Um, and uh, all the indications with the research is showing that um, as a whole, we are coming back up. But if you are taking a strong position on ethics and, and culture, you are getting a much greater value out of that uh, from even a, uh, um, a evaluation of, of enterprise value that in businesses these days. So, so it's all, it always has been about profit for businesses. Um, yeah, uh, well, I would say I, the natural thing is yes, it's been about profit. I would say now people are having a broader perspective of what profit means, because profit just isn't financial. Right. Profit can be so investing in your, the, right. Last century, it was very financially based before. And uh, corporate social responsibility is one of those areas that's a good indication that profits uh, um, uh, the connotation of profit is expanding. So, thank you. You bet. Hey, my name is Stefan Herrenbrook. I'm studying finance. And uh, about those statistics you showed in the beginning, I'm assuming those are compiled from uh, situations where the fraud has been caught. Uh, do you think that's biased those, and maybe that uh, higher level managers and uh, board members are just better at it? <laughs> so it's not reflected in those statistics? Um, the, uh, well, the, the, the study that has been going on, and you can go to uh, look, and you can go look at the full report. It's called Report to the Nation on the Fraud. So it's through, through the ACFE, and you can get it. And they have produced it every, every two years for the last, for as long as I have been in the ethics uh, world. Um, but, uh, you know, are the things, are the, it is, you know, of the fraud incidences that occurred, and of those, these are the people that participated in it, and these were the, you know, the, the averages and the frequency of it. So that's all, it, it's, it's pretty statistical. So, um, yeah. It's <laughs> well, it looks like um, we have time for one more question. Hi, I'm Brian Rose. I'm a senior in management. Um, the thing is, is that I see is with um, with ethics is that I live by three three values very very much every day, and that is honor, courage, and integrity. And courage to do the thing that you know that needs to be done, but there's always that little demon on the side saying, "Hey, we can go this way and still still be okay." Mr. Hall, have you had any times when, when somebody below you was a little bit more ethical than you were and coming across with a decision that you didn't feel really comfortable with? Um, oh, I've, yes, I've had people that have had much clearer you know, decision-making processes than myself at times. I mean, I, I think that happens on a daily basis. Um, and it's just the journey that we're on. The, um, and, you know, I don't take offense to it. Because I, I look for that and I encourage it. It's, it's the only, or I'm going to keep, you know, going into the gray. And so that's why it's, you know, if you want to change a culture, you need to bring, you first have to have the values yourself and then bring people together and hold yourself accountable, um, no matter what your level. Um, so, uh, Yes, I've experienced it. <laughs> That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John and Anara. Uh, and to all of you for being here this evening, uh, I hope that you will thoughtfully consider what you've just heard and understand how your actions are important as a student, how they will be important as a professional and in every aspect of your life. Uh, John, I always like to uh, take this opportunity to give a, a, a token of our appreciation. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. So I'm sure John will stay uh, up front for just a little bit if you want to uh, ask your question directly to him. This concludes our 2014 Dean's Distinguished Lecture. Thank you all for coming. Thanks.